delighted to introduce Mr. Mike Armiger. Mike is going to give us uh, his perspective on staff well-being and outlining the importance of hope, as well as sharing some practical tips uh, for you to support your own well-being. Mike, over to you. Hello, everyone. How are you? It's, um, it's really good to be with you all this morning. I'm sure you've already had a fab morning and I'm very grateful to again um, be supporting another education um, support event. It's fantastic to be with you all. And I just remind you of a couple of things that um, Sinead said just about um, the flow of the presentation. Sometimes people like to fire questions um, when, when you're mid-presentation. So Sinead will do a fantastic job of picking your questions up. So apologies if I don't catch the mid-flow. It will definitely be towards the end of the chat that I will do that. Um, I'd like to start off by saying thank you for joining us. And I know that time is invaluable at the moment. Um, and I hope that you will see this as an investment, um, not in just yourself, but also in the people around you and the staff that you're all working with. Um, firstly, I'd just like to make it really clear. I'm not somebody who has you know, waltzed in this morning without any understanding of the challenges that the profession currently faces. Um, I'm across both health and education. Um, and mainly my responsibility being for um, a nine school trust across Bristol um, and we're in AP so all of our schools are pros and we have one uh, mainstream secondary so you can imagine that you know our challenges are very very similar um, and so the constant guidance the constant lack of um, systematic response in different areas that we are all facing regardless of where we're coming from this morning is, is something that I am familiar with. So I say nothing this morning to you with rose tinted glasses on. I say everything to you this morning from a place of perspective and also a place from hope. And that hope is not naive, I hope. I, I'm personally a big fan of cultivating hope in different um, professions and different scenarios. And especially in terms of mental health, my work in mental health services at the moment is all around cultivating hope for people when often there seems to be very little. So I'm going to take you into the presentation. If you have any questions, by all means, yes, you can direct those um, through the chat function, but I'll also give you my email at the start. So you'll see that on the first slide. So if you have a more detailed question, um, that you'd like to ask and it needs a further consideration of follow-up you, you can email me with that and I'll try my best to get back to you okay right I'm going to take you into the screen now folks okay Jen can you see that it's just your cameras on the screen so um brilliant fab <laughs> I was talking the other day and um, I was about halfway in and then somebody went um we haven't seen your slides yet I was like, oh no no. Um, okay, I'm going to um, pin the camera to me. Um, unfortunately, apologies for that. There we go. It just makes it very easy for me to be able to see what's on the screen. Okay, so as I said, my email is there, folks. So if you have any detailed questions, you can by all means follow up with that afterwards. Um, I want to start off this morning just outlining a couple of concepts very, very quickly. And if you've been in any of my sessions before, a couple of these concepts might be familiar, but the majority of the content, I'm pretty sure um, won't have been covered um, in any of my other sessions that you may have been in. The first thing that I want to just put forward a second is a little bit of a challenge to the current narrative. And I say this in both relation to students and also in relation to staff, but also on a population-based level. Currently, at the moment, some of the narrative that is perpetuated by sources of media, that is perpetuated even within health systems, for example, is currently framed around illness. And it's always talking about the amount of people with mental illness that are coming forward. You know, I'd, I read a statistic yesterday, yesterday was Mental Health Awareness Day, um, and a World Mental Health Day even, sorry. And some of the problems that come with those days are that occasionally we can have this sort of drip 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 effect of all of these stats that come in which are often very important but what they focus on often are people who are experiencing a acute mental health need what they don't cater for and what we really have a problem with are the amount of people who are experiencing very very understandable reactions to a very current abnormal circumstance and whose symptoms are not of necessarily illness but whose symptoms are of chronic stress and possibly even distress. You know, I always say to people, you don't have to be ill in order to experience a very, very difficult time. You don't have to have a diagnosis. You don't have to have any form of mental illness. Actually, sometimes 
chronic stress, long-term stress, acute distress is difficult enough. And, and there's a challenge to this narrative even more so when we think about student and young people, uh, um, students and our young people, and even our young adults, because actually there's this whole narrative that we're going to have this big tsunami of mental illness. And actually what we're seeing, and something I'll put forward in a second uh, in terms of a model to, to demonstrate this even further, is that that's not technically true. And what we're not necessarily seeing are a lot of people who need complex psychiatric services necessarily. What we're seeing is people who need the ability to feel heard, validated, supported, and who need spaces in order to process what's happening for them currently. Now, I don't know about you, this might be familiar, it might not. Um, but there are many people who seem to actually cope very, very well during the last six months and manage incredible um, levels of support and be able to um, prop up different systems, lead from the front, all of those things, who are now finding it very difficult. So it doesn't necessarily fit in with this narrative of, well, you know, actually, after lockdown is finished, you know, everyone's going to come forward with these problems, or during, you know, peak of isolation, people are going to experience those problems then. What we know is that actually, for many, this will be something that emerges over a long period of time. And that's a point I wanted to get across to you today, and this is in relation to both students and adults, because there was a big, big push on saying to people, right, this is what we need after lockdown for students. We need to make sure that we've got a recovery curriculum in place and that needs to last um, all of September. We need to make sure that we're getting all of our safeguards and systems ready because there's gonna be this, this and that. And, and whilst in terms of our students, there were elements of high levels of safeguards and referrals for sure. Actually, what we've seen in many areas is not all of those needs emerging over the first month actually across our systems and across um, Bristol at the moment, what I'm actually seeing in different areas and also in Bath and also in some schools in North Wales that I'm, I'm currently supporting is actually more need starting to emerge now. And so this is in time with how people process events, isn't it? Because we know that often when people are in that place of survival and that needs to regulate themselves. And it takes a much more of our bandwidth than it usually would. It's classic Maslow, of course. But what we know is that during those times, people just cope and they want continuity and they just get through it as best as they possibly can. And most of the time, when you think about adversity, when you think about trauma, whatever it is, the majority of people need space, time, distance away from the immediate problem. Sometimes actually people don't process or contemplate what's happened to them until much later on further down the line. And this is very much reflected in what we're seeing with staff as well in that a lot of our staff have coped incredibly well and continue to do extraordinary things. But there are times where we will see the pendulum swing into different directions for different people. It's not the case that we will all see this happen at the same time. And it might sound like I'm of course stating the obvious, of course, it's obvious that, that this is going to be the case. But for many systems, they pride themselves on all of those needs emerging at the same time. And actually, what we'll do, some schools have done, is that they said we'll front loads and well-being support from September until December, because that will be the most difficult term. And as I've said to them, actually, for many people, it might actually be January to July. So we need to think about how we spread those systems and that support over a long period of time, because those needs will not emerge at the time scale that we often predict. So the thing to also just quickly add before I get into some more hopeful and, and some detailed practical things is to think about the fact that for many people, it's not just one singular event, is it? It's not just, you know, lockdown or workload increasing. It's then less bandwidth to be able to process what's happening in the day. It's then concerns about family. It's then, um, you know, somebody self-isolating. It's then ongoing safety issues. It's then, so it ripples, doesn't it? And so what happens is that we're not dealing from one fallout. We're constantly dealing with those things. And if things are constantly rippling, then we don't necessarily have the time to contemplate. Does that make sense? So... What this model just says, and this is something I've tried to show to all schools, and you're free to, of course, use it, is to just say, look, actually, we need long-term support systems here, and a knee-jerk temporary 
reaction is not going to meet the needs that we think it might, however well intentioned it may be. So a lot of the leaders that I've been speaking to the last couple of months are thinking about actually what services we can provide, how we can liaise with other clusters, how we can liaise with other schools to maybe joint commission things, to maybe think about some longer term approaches that are sustainable. And that, for me, is really what we need, because after this might be over, this element of pandemic, then we're also still going to have some of the same issues, aren't we? This was a problem beforehand. So it doesn't make sense to just think short term at the moment. This is a long term picture that we still need to build. So it goes back to this, really. And I say this ev everywhere in relation to behaviour, in relation to well-being, all of those things. Our greatest resource in our schools, whatever provision we are in across education, are our adults, are our staff. And that's even more highlighted at the moment. In an age now where I'm struggling to get school nurses on site, where you know a lot of social workers are also not coming on site so actually the only regular adult contact professionally sometimes is from education staff for many of our young people who might be under multi multiple agencies that was difficult before the pandemic but also now we're seeing that increase so we really have to understand and we really have to push forward the narrative that we need to do whatever we can to make sure that we have safe calm and regulated adults in our provisions and in order to achieve that, there are a couple of things that I'm maybe going to highlight this morning that might be quite useful to go back and think about in terms of systematic responses. So it's all about looking after people who look after people, essentially, isn't it? And what we know is that for many different elements of um, the workforce at the moment, there are things like not just fatigue and burnout, but there are also things like elements of you know, vicarious experiencing and trauma that we've also got too. And people having to listen to lots of different things that have been that have affected our students and other adults but there's also something at the moment that i think is probably going under the radar a little bit and that is that many of our staff members are currently going through elements of re-experiencing certain things that feel very familiar to different periods of their life that were maybe a little bit more difficult previously so the feeling of isolation might be reminiscent of a very difficult period in their life. The feeling of being overstretched might be quite triggering for them in relation to something that they previously experienced. So for this time, many of us might be aware of what those things are and we might be able to action them. But for many of us, we're not necessarily self-aware of what those things mean and what effect they're having on us. So we need to be mindful that many of our staff members at the moment might be re-experiencing some very difficult emotional states and very difficult reminders of those times. So it might be important for us to maybe navigate that conversation in the most appropriate way with ourselves, but also maybe with the people that support us too. So let's get into some practical thoughts. Um, I am very keen on um, matching up all of the different things we talk about with, with alert states in our brain and talking about reframing thoughts, all of those things. But I think what often we miss is that we miss at the whole body. We miss the neck down. We talk about this from a very cognitive aspect when actually much of what we see at the moment is born out of no choices and is born out of adaptations that are often subconscious. So let me explain what I mean by that. So when we experience something, whether it's adverse, whether we call it traumatic, whether it's difficult, challenging, you know, our body adapts in order to survive, doesn't it? And that might be in terms of your breath cycles. That might be in terms of where you hold tension. That might be in terms of our nervous systems. But multiple different elements of that also mean that actually after that experience, we're, we're not the same, and understandably so. But physio physiologically, we change. So for many people, they, I was speaking about this the other day, that people feel that their chest is quite tight. And of course, at the moment, that's a concern for people, obviously, with, you know, with, symptom, uh, with symptoms and worrying about you know, getting them off for a test and all of those different things. But actually, there's a lot of emotional elements that actually come to the centre of the chest, aren't there? And I'll talk to you about those in a second. 
there are lots of people who have talked to me about the fact that, you know, actually they find themselves squeezing things a lot more and they find themselves actually holding tension and then releasing it a lot more, but feeling that they can't release it because they're constantly in a state of tension. There are people who talk about the fact that they're getting back pain because they're hunched over their laptops a little bit more. You know, all of those adaptations that come that aren't ones that we necessarily choose, but are very affecting. And so what we have to do is not just reflect uh, this needs to be reflected not just in cognitive systems and in talking about things, but also relating to practical strategies that we can all do to regulate our emotional states every single day. One of the first things that I do in mental health services when somebody comes in to see me, whether it is um, in terms of them um, being in crisis, or whether it's in terms of you know talk, talking about their well-being generally day to day, one of the very first things I do is make sure that physically they have all the regulation aids available to them. So, you know, I'm trying to notice fluctuations in temperature. I'm trying to make sure that they've got um, choice over their seating so that they feel grounded. You know, all of those different things. And I'm not saying that we can necessarily do that all the time in our settings. But what we can do is start to build an awareness of how we're managing to self-regulate at the moment. And for many people, that can be very difficult. You know, a lot of people self-regulate in many different ways when they find things difficult. We know that. The people will um will, will self-regulate through various different ways it might be through running it might be through breathing exercises it might be through doing none of that and holding a lot of tension it might be through fluctuations in mood and it might be through things like alcohol so we all know that we regulate in different ways at different times and bringing awareness to that can be difficult so if we focus on the things that we can do physically easily in our provisions then i think that will be a very good first step and i'm going to share with you some of those things that we can think about so we talked about the tight chest the other thing i want to talk to you about this morning is to think about actually where we hold when we were talking about the the sadness element uh, sorry the chest area earlier the other thing that has come up time and time and time again with young people and adults over the last six months is this feeling of sadness. And a lot of people have talked to me and said, I feel sad, but, but I can't cry. It's very difficult for me to cry. I don't know why I'm not crying. Is that weird? And, and I think the problem is, is that people associate being sad with crying. They believe that that's sometimes the only emotion and the only way to display that emotion. And actually, of course, what we know is that many people display sadness in all sorts of ways. And chronic sadness often is not necessarily the ability to cry, but is the ability to feel something constantly difficult in different areas of your body. So, for instance, I always say to people when they talk to me about, you know, actually I haven't cried yet, and it might be that they've experienced bereavement, or it might be that they're sad at feeling isolated, all of those things. I always say to them, look, just because you're not crying doesn't mean you aren't sad. And you might, you might cry at some point. It might not be now, it might be later. Or you might find that you don't cry at all. It actually might manifest in different ways. But that doesn't mean you're not sad, and it's important for us to validate that. The other thing as well is that many, many people um, at the moment have talked I think I must have this conversation at least once a day at the moment in different provisions about how we resource panic attacks because they're saying that many of their staff members are um, experiencing that, that feeling in their chest and they're, and they're struggling to stay on top of things and that's manifesting physically in, in anxiety. Now I've, I've recorded a video for um, uh, for Education Support Partnership about this and we, and we, talked, and we talked about this um, and I think that was released um, on Monday which was um, yesterday, wasn't it? No, Sunday. I've lost all track of days. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, time has just gone. Um, but yeah, on the website, there is, there is a recent picture for that. Um, but just to outline elements that we can think about here, for many of us, this would have been a scenario that has maybe happened to us. But for those of us who it hasn't, or those of us who haven't had to maybe support somebody else, I just wanted to very quickly highlight a few things that we could consider. So thinking about smells, sights, and all of those different sensory stimulus is really important. Um, and the reason that it's very important, because, you know, when we try to cognitively work with these things, it can be a struggle because, you know, as much as we tell somebody that everything's OK, actually, sometimes physiologically, that's not registering because this is in a state of panic. So, of course, we should think about encouraging them to breathe. That goes without saying, you know, deep, long breaths where we possibly can and trying to slow and move back to rhythmic breathing, of course. But we should also think about grounding. 
actually I often tell people either to get to the ground, to take a seat on a chair, or for them to go up against a wall. Um, and the wall is useful because sometimes obviously seating isn't available, but also because it works to regulate our temperature a little bit too, because people report feeling either very hot sometimes or very cold. And often when they report feeling hot, the wall is a good one because often those places are quite cool. So it helps again promote that element of sensory feedback. But one of the other things that I use is that whole element of what can you see, what can you smell, all of those things to try and bring us present. For many young people that I work with, um, and some young adults as well, um, some of the tools that I give them are also based around sensory. So I use, for instance, a lot of peppermint oil. You know, actually, I'm not saying you go and waft peppermint oil under people's noses and faces, of course not. It has to be based on autonomy and choice. We have to be you know, very careful and mindful about sensory triggers. But for many people, it's a really simple resource. And the reason that peppermint is useful is because it's quite shocking to our sensory system, so it can bring us quite present and reorientate us quite quickly. So those are things that we can think about in terms of resourcing people with panic attacks. But understand, if you, if you haven't had one, it does. It can feel like a heart attack. It can. It feels like your chest is about to burst. So you know, people can become very stressed and distressed with it. So be very mindful of that. And there are just some tips that I thought was important to talk to you about this morning because it is something that many people are mentioning. So let's think about before we get to that point. OK, because obviously we want this to be hopeful and I'll talk to you about some hopeful elements in a second that we can also think about. Um, can we supply them regulation aids? A lot of people are talking about gripping their water bottles or they have something in their hands whilst they're teaching. Some, um, I use a slinky sometimes, not because I'm necessarily anxious when I'm, when I, when I'm working in um, a setting, but sometimes it's just useful in terms of regulation. Um, the other regulation aids that sometimes people do is it might just be that, you know, they've got their ball pen or whatever it is. So, you know, there's certain things that they can reach for. Hydration is key. It's always a good way, especially when you're feeling quite anxious, you know, mouth dry, all of those different things. Hydration is really important. But actually, can we get an identified space for people to go to? Is there a space that they can go to just grab a breath, you know, when, when and as they need to? Building that safety is something I'll talk about a lot more in a second. The other thing that we might think about as well is that if people are feeling um, a little bit more anxious, maybe, and um, they might um, be sat at their computer a little bit more when they're teaching, maybe, maybe that's because of social distancing or those things. You know, what, what I've tried to say to some of my staff that I'm working with currently is to say, you know, as much as yes, we might need to be distanced in certain times, it's also still very important for you to move because that's naturally our rhythm when we're delivering sometimes, isn't it? And if that's restricted, actually our anxiety and our regulation might actually go and our energies might go into different areas that aren't necessarily useful. So trying to come up with a flowing rhythm in the classroom in terms of physical movement is also a really good idea for people. So those are just some strategies for us to work with the, physiolog um, the physiological angles of anxiety. But I wanted to talk to you about hope and about safety to finish things off and to give you some detailed thoughts and some things that you can reflect on going forward. These have been my two main um, strategies to reach for at the moment and the things that I think about all the time. How are we making people feel safe? Because it's very difficult to make people feel safe at the moment, isn't it, mid-pandemic? There's such a lack of certainty, such a lack of safety in areas that actually the world outside can seem very, very difficult and very complex to navigate. But we can still build aspects of safety with all of what's going on out there, right in front of us, in our provisions, in our settings, we can still have the ability to build that safety. Who's available for us to go and talk to? You know, one of the things that I've seen, which has been really encouraging, because it's very difficult to get everybody together unless we're on Zoom, it's very difficult for, you know, leaders to be able at senior management level to be able sometimes to get conversations with everybody. So we're relying a lot more on middle leaders and we're relying a lot more on heads of departments, which I think is a good thing in terms of equipping those people with the right skills. And we've needed to upskill those people and push resources further downstream forever. We've always needed to do that. But also the strain that it puts on them, we need to be mindful of. But we also need to make sure that we equip them with the time and the space to be able to sit with staff and be able to support them. So in terms of who is safe, it could be people that necessarily weren't having to hold those spaces previously. So have we got time and space for them in terms of timetable? Have they got the ability to do that? Have they got you know, things like access to training that they might want and that they might need? They might not have a line managed before. They might be very new to this. 
So how are we equipping them with the relational safety that they might need? So where and what is safe? Do we have spaces that people can go to at the moment where they can take a breath, where they can reflect? Where Because a lot of the time people are moving outside of the room and so they can't necessarily stay in one room all day. Sometimes people do have to stay in one room all day. So how are we catering for that? Is there any element of safety within people's bubbles that we're encouraging just for them, places that they can go to? And it can be something simple. I know, for instance, that um, there was there was a resource cupboard in one of the classrooms that I used to teach in and I'd pretty much stay there all day I couldn't necessarily move um, because of the nature of the children that I was with I would be with them for the majority of the day and we used to have a, a cupboard in our classroom that you would step into and sometimes just either take a breath and re-regulate or grab a biscuit whatever it was and um, so you know it could be something simple as physical space but it can also be something as you know actually what is our structural and systematic safety which I'll talk to you about in a minute but, you know, also thinking about safe periods of time as well, you know, maybe it's when the students have gone, are we thinking about what processes for debrief that we have in place? Are we thinking about if there is a serious incident, how we're best supporting staff afterwards? Is there a post-incident debrief that we can really heighten at the moment when things might be difficult in terms of students' regulatory behaviours and all of those things? You know, again, excuse me, something's just fallen down in the corner. Um, again, these are, these are issues most of the time. But you know, I think for many different people, these are being spotlighted at the moment too. So building safety in these different ways and what we can consider to equip people with that uh, psychological safety and physical safety is key. But I want to talk to you a little bit about hope this morning. And this for me is, is so important. And, and I talked to you about um, safety just now in terms of you know, what's in front of us. But for many of us, there are different aspects of the world at the moment that are feeling like an invasion of our psychological safety. And so there's just two things before I get on to hope that I want to talk to you about. Firstly, um, information. Now, for many of us, we know that the huge amount of statutory guidance that's coming out at the moment, we know that the news, all of those different things is very difficult for people. And many people have said, well, actually, you know, we should be encouraging people, you know, to try and limit their news and stay away from social media, which is, is that if that works for you, then that's great and that's fine. But for many people, that's also the way that they're feeling connected. They're feeling connected to other people and getting support through social media, maybe. So actually, one of the things that I've, I've said to people is, you know, can you put certain words on mute? Could you put virus? Could you put COVID on, on, on mute, maybe? So you don't have to necessarily have that on your newsfeed. So you can still use your phone for the best way to keep connected, maybe. Also think about where we're getting our information from. Now, I... I hate to say this, um, but in many different areas, there is a real lack of trust in governments, not necessarily in terms of you know, education, maybe, and necessarily in your area. It's different for everybody, dependent on what authority you're in and where in Wales you are. But for many people, you know, that trust in government isn't necessarily always there in terms of the guidance. So we have to think about reliable sources of information outside of government too. So are we equipping people with the NHS resources? Do we have access to those? The NHS library, for instance, is a wonderful resource that provides us with resources for children and young people as well. So where we get our information from can be key. But the other thing, just before I come on to hope, is also thinking about actually a lot of people have got a real heightened awareness of death at the moment and that they're thinking very existentially and when you're thinking existentially a lot of the time about meaning about life about what it means to be human your life and reflecting on it all of those things it can be exhausting it can be very very tiring so we need to think about actually how we can move those people to, to try and be present and also to have those difficult conversations where we need to maybe on a social level with people, because it is something that people are, I think, having more conversations about, which is a good thing in the long term, but very difficult sometimes for people to, um, to cope with. And then the whole point of this is that actually when these things feel uncertain, people can fill those spaces with lots of different thoughts and feelings, which aren't necessarily always accurate or always rational. You know, people can put two and two together and come out with 10, for example. So we have to be mindful of that. The last thing that I'm going to say is a little more hopeful now. Um, and how we cultivate hope is really, really important in, in our modern world at the moment, more probably now than ever. I'm finding that what is really useful is for us to reflect on different periods of our collective history, both in terms of our nation, both in terms of um, our, 
our, our world, our country, our families, all of those things where things have been difficult, but we've overcome. Um, I lost my grandmother in March um, and she was a wonderful lady um, she was in, in her 90s, had a wonderful life um, and I know I certainly won't be the only person um, but the reason I tell you this story is because it is based around hope so just before um, a, a couple of weeks before lockdown came and before we sort of really knew anything about Covid I was having a conversation with her um, and I was talking to her about the fact that you know the world just seemed a little bit unsafe at the moment you know little did I know what was coming and, and I was talking to her about the upheaval and I said to her, I just feel like your generation were much better equipped and more able to cope than my generation are. And she got really cross with me. She got really cross. And she said, what do you mean? What, what, what are you talking about? Of course we weren't. And I said, well, you know, I said, that's, that's just how I think. I always think your generation, you know, coped and, and, I, and I just don't know how ours were. And she said, we had no more resources and we had no idea of what was going on half the time. She said, your generation have information, which is neither a good or a bad thing. But she said, we had no idea what was going on from one day to the next. Things were very unsafe. We didn't know what, if people were going to come back from where they'd had to go and fight. We didn't know about food, you know, we had lots of food insecurity, all those things. So she said, you know, many of the challenges that we're facing, that, 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 that you face, um, are very similar to, to the things that we did. And she said, what you will find is that you will cope, you will adapt, people will come together, and they will do those things to get through. She said, because we didn't have a clue and we didn't feel that we were equipped either, but we coped and we did and we overcame. And, and that, that, for some reason, made me feel very, very hopeful. And, and actually reminders of hopeful times are things that I try to support people with in mental health services. Um, so whether it's cultivating hope with young people, there was a wonderful activity, I can't remember what school in South Wales it was, um, that sent me that they were doing um, a hope tree every every sort of week, where they were getting the things, um, they were getting children to just put their hopes on the tree, whether it's hopes for the week, whether it's hope for um, you know long term, whatever it was. Um, but they were talking about the importance of hope, and I thought that was really important. So we need to allow staff to feel that hope as well, whether it's, you know, that there's something to look forward to next week that we're doing collectively, whether we're trying to um, cultivate hope longer term, or whether we're providing, um, you know, quotes that are uplifting, whether it's just the, the space and the time to talk about hopeful things or humour, all of those things. I, I think we really need to build systems around that. Cultivating hope is such a fascinating area of um, research at the moment that, that um, colleagues of mine are looking at. And one of the things that they've already said is that the, the ability to feel hope or the lack of it often is reflected in terms of people accessing support, wanting to access support, feeling supported, all of those things, which sounds obvious, but you know, the, the absence of hope is very significant for people's health. So we have to be very mindful of that. So actually providing times when, you know, the world's come together or our country's come together or reminds us of something that's hopeful has a real benefit to people's health. So in terms of feeling hopeful and in terms of being able to process all of those things, I think at the moment what we need is some time and some spaces for people to be reflective. And when I say reflective, it doesn't necessarily always need to result in a conversation. It can, it can take form, it can take many different forms. But I think the problem that people have with reflection is that often people think that it's sometimes selfish. And they think the carving out time for themselves is, you know, can be just an investment in them. And I always say to people, it's, you know, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, safe, calm, regulated adults. That's what we need. So it's not, an it's not just an investment in you, it's an investment in everybody. That, that's really key to put forward. So for many of, um, for many settings that I've spoken to recently, they talked about putting together buddy systems. You know, instead of having a direct support model, they talked about building more peer-based support. So that actually, you know, they're providing times in the school um, calendar where people may be, whether it's over Zoom or whether it's physically, are having those conversations. It doesn't necessarily need to be on school site. You know, it can be on school site, they facilitate that. But maybe that reflection space looks different. Um, they've also talked about, you know, whether it's maybe um, maybe a staff going for a walk. You know, it doesn't matter what that reflective space looks like. People can have autonomy over that and they can create those reflective spaces. But building time for it and placing an emphasis on it is, is really key. 
So some of the elements that actually um, some people have come back with, we put together a, a half an hour time and said, look, you know, each day we want to build this into the school day. So, you know, at this time, instead of doing all the briefing, we can do that in the morning. Let, let's just be able to be, let's be able to talk, let's be able to cultivate hope. And, you know, you can do this wherever you want. So, you know, actually people went for a walk around school side, they went off somewhere local, um, you know, maybe as they went to a local drive through and got a coffee and, and get, whatever it was, but they built in time for reflection. But one of the things that we did pre pandemic, which is actually very useful at the moment, um, is we thought about this process and what it would look like and sort of a peer reflection model. And this was just an example process. Now we've changed it obviously the questions at the moment, because, you know, some of them needed fine tuning a little bit more, but, but this is just an example of what that process could look like. Just open questions, reflecting on positives and challenges that we're facing at the moment. And again, this isn't in terms of management. This is not something which is top down. This is organic and ground up. So people sit together and reflect on this um, in, in pairs, in small groups, you know, however it is they want to facilitate that. But, but the key aspects of it is that there's a focus on checking in with people, there's a focus on reflecting on the positives, but also thinking about what our challenges are and how we need to remain healthy. And, and that's really important for me that the focus is there, rather than waiting until crisis hits, so that we have these forums. And yes, not everyone's going to engage in them. And yes, not everybody will find them necessarily useful. And yes, not everybody will need them at you know, the time that they arise. But providing constant spaces for reflection means that we give people the ability to feel heard, validated when they can, if they want to engage in that. So that's an example of a reflective process that is that is in place in different areas and different provisions. And you will have your own processes for reflection individually and maybe collectively. And my question is, I suppose, is how do we build those in? Do we need to put them into a system so that people are doing it? Or do we need to leave it up to individuals can we get the right balance where actually we're providing time within a system to do it, but people still have autonomy over it? Because that's the key, isn't it? We can't inflict well-being and reflection on people. We can't do that. We've got to try and make sure that they remain autonomous over it too. So just, just one practical thing, which um, I wanted to include in today, um, just, just before I finish. And that is resourcing people to go to the GP, because I know that this is a conversation that many people are having at the moment. And it's a conversation that we'll possibly all be familiar with. So I'm going to just give some advice that I give to students at university, I give to patients, I give to educators, you know, whoever it is, I give them the same advice. And I always say to them, if somebody's going to the GP, there's a really, really good piece of work that you could do beforehand, okay? Um, and the piece of work, is pre them going into the room. One of the things that happens when people, you know, if they need to go to the GP for, for mental health reasons, whether it's medication related or not, whether it's that, you know, they, they're struggling with anxiety, mental health needs, whatever it is, people will often access the GP for multiple reasons. Now, we need to understand that the majority of people at the moment who are really struggling are not under mental health services at all. So actually, primary care and GPs are often the go-to service for these people. So actually, this conversation is key. So the first thing to think about is actually, before we get into the room, how are we going to express what's going on for us currently? Because for many people, actually, what happens sometimes is that they clam up, not through their own fault, or not through their own desires, but just the situation can feel overwhelming. So sometimes what I say to people is, look, you know, just before you go in, it may be that you might want to write, write them down on your phone. It might be that you write these things down on a piece of paper, or maybe if they're open enough to doing it, maybe you could have somebody that goes in with you if you're able or is on the Zoom call with you, however that appointment is being conducted. Um, you know, there's certain limits on things at the moment, so that might be difficult. So it might be somebody maybe producing those notes with you. And then what you can do is you can hand that phone over or you can hand those notes over to the GP or read them off there, can't you, if you've really struggled with words. Now, the other thing to explain as well is that, you know, people may be medicated for mental health related difficulties so there's a couple of things that maybe we could pass on in terms of information around that the first thing is is that commonly it takes sometimes two or three medication reviews before people actually get the right dosage and the right balance for them but the problem is is that they don't know that going in so what often happens is that people then go in they start on a course of medication and then a couple of weeks later they either experience side effects or they think that it hasn't necessarily worked as best as it could and then they think, oh, gosh, well, you know, I, 
this is this has failed it's not working when actually in actual fact that's the case for most people but they feel very isolated and on their own and they don't know that other people experience that so it might be a really good idea for us to communicate if one of our colleagues is going to the GP look you know sometimes it might take you two or three different goes but don't worry that's quite normative the other thing to, to do as well is to say to them your GP should book you a, a medication review in but if they don't you're well within your rights to, 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 to alter that review and to say look I need this medication may be reviewed whether you're experiencing side effects or not maybe and that's really important because it means that we have the opportunity to discuss and to see if we need to actually review that medication going forward. So those are things which I think is sometimes very important for people to know before they go in. And that necessarily doesn't always come from management. Of course, it might be you talking to a colleague. It might be you talking to a friend. It might be you yourself thinking about those things. So those are just some tips and some advice that we can maybe give to people before we go. The last things I'm gonna share with you, number one, um, just before lockdown, um, sorry, um, in the first month of lockdown, um, there was a, a big problem with a lot of people remaining in their homes and, you know, feeling very isolated and struggling to cope with different feelings and emotional states. So we, we were thinking about the fact that a lot of, there's lots of wellbeing advice out there. There's lots of strategies that you could do. There's lots of things that you have. But one of the problems is, is that, you know, they're in multiple different places. So what myself and, and a, a huge number of colleagues did, um, and it was co-produced by some brilliant people and I'm so thankful to them for doing it um, is we put together a website called www.wellbeingandcoping.net so we did this in association with NHS funding and basically what it is is it's a website where there are a pile of well-being strategies and what you can do is you can go to what we call the 3330 approach so it's things that you can do for 30 seconds that like might give you an immediate boost it's things you can do for three minutes to maybe distract you or it's Deeper investment may be over 30 minutes. So that's why it's called 3330. Um, and what this what this website does is it gives you the ability to maybe build a well-being plan, whether that's for you, a colleague, you know, whoever that might be. But it gives you some strategies that can be reached for that don't necessarily cost money, that don't rely on outdoor space, that you can do in your home. So it goes across multiple different demographics. You don't need to have you know, the ability to have internet access maybe for this. You know, it, it is inclusive, hopefully. So have a look at that website and, and build it into maybe some resources that you collate, maybe it's some website pages, as well, of course, as all, as the, all of the wonderful resources that you will be signposted th uh, to throughout today, because there really are a wide range of them. Um, I have to say they are a fantastic organisation, education support, so we really need to utilise the resources that are there too. So the last thing that I want to talk to you about before I round up. Um, there was a story two weeks ago um, about, and I've always been a fan of doing this, but there was a story that really hit it home to me. And it was of a NQT that had um, started a new job in a school and they'd been delayed in starting. And they started um, just a couple of weeks ago. And when I went in and, and I first met them in the provision that they were in, because um, I'd, I'd asked to meet them as an NQT, I said to them, you know, how, how, how did it go when, you know, I know you're coming straight in, you know, during this, so it must have been difficult. How are you? And they were talking about the fact that they'd received a really useful induction and that, you know, staff were really friendly and all of those things. But what they'd actually had as well was they'd had a handwritten letter from um, members of the school. So it was student, um, I think it was a parent, I think it was a governor, I think it was the head um, member of management and then a couple of colleagues they were going to be working with closely as well. And they'd all written them a handwritten letter, just welcoming them to the school, just saying thank you, um, just telling them a little bit about themselves and all of the things that they could expect. And, and they said it was just, it was the thing that made me realise that I was going to be looked after, that I was going to be okay. And at the moment it made such a massive difference because they said they couldn't have been a more anxious time for me to be coming into school. You know, he said, I was thinking about going off and doing something else. I wasn't sure if I could do it, but that made me feel like I could. So whether it's a little note, whether it's a little thank you, whatever it is, I think the ability to build compassion within our schools has always been there, but it's even more important right now. So however, however we can build that into our settings and it needs to be led and it needs to also be organic at the same time, we need to provide time, we need to provide space for people to do that, I think is really key. Wouldn't it be lovely if people knew that when they went into their provisions that there were those constant acts of kindness and compassion that just became part of the way of doing things and part of their culture? 
I think it's something for us to think about. Is there something we could do? Is there something little that we could start that might ripple? So I'm just going to finish by saying thank you for having me today um, and for all that you're doing at the moment. I think one of the things that I am constantly amazed about is our resiliency as a profession, for sure. But I also greatly worry about the systematic responses and, and pressure that is on us too. So take that time. Remember, it's an investment. Remember, you are our greatest resource. If there's anything that we can ever do, um, please get in touch. We're always here to help. And um, like will be highlighted throughout today, remember, please don't wait until things are really difficult before you get in touch. It's always a good idea to get in touch sooner rather than later. Take good care, look after yourselves, and I'll really look forward to hopefully seeing you all very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Mike. As ever, um, there's so much to take away from what you've just said, from the practicalities of approaching a GP visit, which for many will be an unknown, through to the, the hope tree and the focus on kindness and compassion. That's a really rich set of thoughts for us to take away, so thank you. Um, there are some really lovely comments in the chat. Uh, in terms of questions, I'm going to invite colleagues if you have questions to ask them. I want to check in with Catherine Reese if I can. Catherine, I, I think you asked a question about safe spaces for staff given that they're in bubbles under COVID-19 and whether there's, there are more creative ways to do it. I think you asked that question as Mike was starting to talk about how we yeah. can approach that. Is that right? Yes, I asked the question before he actually showed the slides. It was like he was reading your mind. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, though I still took away the advice around having a cupboard to step into and breathe and critically to have a biscuit from. Um, so I'll, I'll stick with that. Um, and slightly correlated to the biscuit, Mike, I, I, I was interested to read at the end of last week, the Mental Health Foundation has published some interesting research about how people have coped during COVID. And very much to the points you made at the start of your talk, you know, they've indicated that people have coped very well, actually, with stress uh, in COVID. One of the things that they flagged that we do when we're coping, but perhaps not in the healthiest way for ourselves, is they're signaling overeating and, and over drinking, I guess, uh, at this time in particular. I know it's something that people uh, raise with us a lot. I know in our school cultures, you know, in normal times, we can have a good laugh about going out on a Friday night and having a big night, uh, certainly with some of the younger age group of teachers. Um, but I think this point about alcohol and food is, is probably important. But is that something that you, you, you talk to people about that you have a point of view on? It's a very important point. And... Um... You know, like you say, there, there's some humour involved in it, of course, to, you know, that is both important and both um, the need to keep it light. But it's also a very serious point, especially what we're facing at the moment, you know, especially with, you know, overeating. I mean, my, my waistband has um, expanded significantly um, and I am just grateful that um, we've written flexible waistbands into um, trust uniform policy. No, I'm joking. Um, that would be nice, though. But the, the, the thing to for me to point out is I think for people to still remain autonomous over their own choices and their decisions. But what we must do is we must respect it. So one of the things that I think is a culture within education, um, I saw this, you know, as a PE teacher, especially to start with, I mean, it certainly don't look like one now, but previously, you know, I would always be on fruit and I would always you know, be trying to remain healthy. And I think staff rooms can be a source of biscuits, cakes, goodness knows what else. And that's fine. But my, 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 my problem is not with that. My problem is sometimes the challenge from other colleagues when you walk in with a piece of fruit. So actually, I think what we need to be mindful of is respecting people's choices and actually encouraging those different approaches. So actually it shouldn't be, oh, come on, just have a slice of cake because people at the moment are very, very concerned, rightly so, about different elements of that. So I think there's more of a duty in our response rather than necessarily our systematic um, one. It's more of a personal response that I think I take a little bit of issue with and we need to be mindful of. I hope that answers the question in some sort of way. It does. I think it's there's always that fine line of, you know, we, we, we can't be judging others and we do have responsibility ourselves, I think, to reflect on our own choices. Um, but no, I, 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 I think you make that point very well. Um, it, it's interesting to see Catherine Turner talking about the way they've reshaped their staff room to make it feel like a more comfortable place. 
Uh, and obviously you've got to have some kind of rota as to who's coming in when, but it sounds like a really positive way of making that space more inclusive and more restful for people. Um, Claire Anthony's asked whether government is understanding that this is not just a short term knee jerk set of issues around the mental health of the workforce, but that there are longer term things here. And, and I think Claire, I would say in the conversations I've had leading up to this project, there is an understanding of that. Um, I think, however, it's really important. I, I can't remember whether you were in the previous session, but I had asked people and I ought to ask again for people who are in this session to keep talking to us and telling us the things that you feel are important. The um, general circulated link to a short questionnaire, but I think that's like a three minute questionnaire and in it we can capture things that people think are important and sustainability of investment into mental health and well-being of the workforce, I think is one of the messages that I would expect to see coming through that. Um, the Raymond has asked whether there is any management advice uh, for staff who are maybe exasperated uh, in dealing with, with students uh, in, in trying to get learners to be cooperative and respectful. Any, any thoughts on that one, Mike? Yes, this is actually something I was discussing the other day. Um, I think it goes back to um, allowing autonomy and flexibility over approach. So one of the things that I've been really clear on with staff is around teaching and learning models. So I've said to people that, you know, actually it is absolutely pointless as saying as a provision, whether it's secondary, primary, college, whatever setting you're in, the one teaching and learning model is, you know, with this is the way that we do things here at the moment. Now, of course, we differentiate, we scaffold, we do whatever we normally would in terms of learning. But at the moment, I've actually said to staff, let's allow us maybe at some times, certain days a week, if those things are becoming difficult, to sit alongside learning. And maybe some of those students have been so used to personalised learning, whether it's through the laptop, whether it's project based, but whatever it is, or that those habits are just not there because they haven't been learning at all, then, then we have to have um, flexible approaches which are approved by management and we have to be really clear on that because I think at the moment it's not a case of just saying well actually you know you need to improve your relationship with them you need to do x y and z this this is a real concern because we are seeing for instance in one of our schools um there was there were children that were um, explaining that they were really hungry through different points of the day and the reason being when we dug a bit deeper was because they weren't really used to having meals at home they were just constantly snacking so actually, we need to change the way that we were even introducing food into the system. So we not only had one break time, we also had another short break where they could then get another snack. Um, and then eventually they started to move back towards that lunch model of being able to eat all of that. But we were seeing children not being able to eat all of their lunch. And that is massively rare in the demographics that, you know, that, that we work in. So it just just goes to prove for me that actually there are so many ripples out from this in terms of social and psychological physical behaviors that actually giving flexibility and approach to certain staff members is so important and giving them the mandate to make those professional choices is is really key brilliant um there are some other uh, very kind comments from Kelly and other colleagues there as well. But Alison's asked a question around how do you deal with colleagues who make remarks about staff who have to self isolate a few times? And Alison, I'm guessing the kind of comment is a sort of pokey, oh, you're off again, are you? type of thing. There's a head nod going on there. How do you deal with that, Mike? <laughs> um, I, I find it quite difficult um, to. Um, listen to some of those comments because it is incredibly difficult for people to step into self-isolation anyway you know regardless of the circumstance for many people it's not the you know the um the, the rest on the sofa kind of job is it it's really not for many but one of the things that i i've i've said is that i do also understand and somebody likened it in a brilliant scenario the other way they said sometimes it feels like you've picked up the hose and you're fighting the biggest fire that you can see and other people at certain times are putting their hoses down and you've remained there holding your hose at all time and the fire is just still there and it's not diminishing. And actually seeing other people lay the hoses down can be really demoralizing. And sometimes those hoses are not laid down through choice, it's through necessity and safety. But if you're the person that is constantly there firefighting, it, it can feel demoralizing. So I think an appreciation of that is key to start with. 
but but secondly um i think it also um means that we we have to be really clear that it's not a personal choice that it's following guidelines and and you know i just think resorting to guidelines is really key um i just can i Sinead, just very quickly um come back to um to raymond's question as well because there was something that i wanted to say about um the exasperation sort of control management um, management advice um just very quickly what i'd what i'd also say is that um it, it's very difficult for me to give a huge amount of advice you know here and now and it might be something raymond that you can you can email me with and, and follow up if you want to or or speak to um Sinead and, and 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 all the team there but i i would i would say that um it's in terms of management, so not just necessarily given the autonomy um, and all the things we mentioned previously, in terms of managing those scenarios, it is very, very difficult at the moment because there's increased emotions on both sides. So I think it might be a devolved model that was also using too. So going back to maybe equipping middle leaders and heads of departments too, where appropriate and colleagues with the ability to have those reflection times based on staff um, on, on children's behaviour too. So I'm wondering if there's some devolved models that we can maybe look at and how we support management in doing that. Raymond, if, if you'd like to email me with that, because I know I might not necessarily got all of the question, uh, all of the answers that you might need. So just let me know um, and I'll, I'll get some more information to you. Thank you, Mike. And I think we, we, we probably shouldn't, but we will, Jen, close your eyes. We'll just squeeze in the very last question there from Jane. Jane, you're asking about performance management and, you know, I guess the, the setup being different, but expectations for performance being the same as they ever were. In terms of your question, is that around how to respond to the, the expectations of management or how to structure it? Just help me understand exactly where you're coming from there. You're welcome to put your microphone on if you can. Oh, hello. Um, hi, it's just that management seem to be carrying on as if we are not in the middle of a pandemic and everything is business as usual. So they don't seem to understand that, you know, staff are really stressed and that um, being observed um, with the same expectations as previously is just adding to stress for staff on top of how they feel ready. Yeah. Mike, do you want to add, say anything on that? I mean, it, it's just, it's such, it's such a complex question, but you, you're right to highlight it, Jane. It's, it, it, it doesn't seem fair at the moment, does it? And I know from, from both angles, there is that, you know, leaders are still being held to account. So there's still that need for accountability and still that need for them to say, it almost feels like we're running two schools, isn't it? There's the COVID school, and then there's regular school, you know, all the things long term that we've got to think about with our development plans alongside day to day management. It's really hard, but I think there is a very good role for unions to play here. And, and I think that's really key. The first thing I would say is, you know, actually make sure that you're speaking to your union about those things and see if there's anything on a national platform and mandate that they've agreed in terms of um, policies around performance management. Secondly, I do think that there needs to be an open discussion and realistic expectation this year because half of the performance management criteria actually can't be met with some circumstances. So I think looking at the template that people are using and the criteria first is a really good idea because it then means that you have an ability to say, well, hang on a minute, due to the current way of operating, I can't fulfill X, Y and Z criteria. So if we're going to do it, at least can we adapt it? So there's there's some conversations I think there that definitely need to be had for sure. And I'm sorry if, if that's something you're experiencing at the moment, Jane, I am thinking of you. I think there's a bit we can add on there and, and maybe to the team at Education Support, Jennifer and, and, uh, and Anthony, it may be an opportunity for us to look at how we can interact with governors um, and the support that we can offer through the system by encouraging governors to really take hold of this point of how they are supporting well-being and mental health in the school and really practically at this time exactly the point that Jane makes about you know this is not business as usual and it, it is just it's it's just entirely unrealistic and actually damaging for management expectations to assume that it is the same as ever it was when we know it, it clearly isn't so let us take that away Jane and, and again and um, if you do go, fill out the survey that, that Jen Hart has posted there uh, in the chat do mention that point about performance management and realistic expectations and then that's something that we can go away and, and do some further work on and um, 
I want to thank uh, everybody who's attended this morning and thank you for your interaction and your engagement and questions, really appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank obviously particularly Mike Armager, uh, as ever a great supporter of education support and the work we do and in his own right just always a pleasure uh, to listen to his insight and experience. So Mike thank you for, for taking the time to join us this morning uh, in kicking off this project.